Welcome to Abiding Presence Lutheran Church, a place of grace. All are welcome. Our mission here is to seek God and serve others. Some exciting news has occurred this week. Council met and voted to host an intern at Abiding Presence for a year, providing this congregation with an opportunity to serve the greater church in the formation of a future pastor, to receive pastoral leadership from a seminarian for a year, and to give Abiding Presence time to form a call committee for our future pastor. In the weeks ahead, we will meet our intern, Stefan Swanson. Until then, may we keep Stefan and Abiding Presence in our prayers. And now let us turn our hearts and minds for worship. We continue with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us, and in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. 
O God, you direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into people who welcome your word and serve one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now we continue with the first reading from Jeremiah chapter 28. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all, all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied about war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the world of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. reading from Romans chapter 6 beginning at verse 12 do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions no longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do, not, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? 
But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking to you in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get of the things which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage that you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Well, hi. Uh, it's good to speak to you again. And I, uh, kids, I have a question for you. What is your favorite song that you sing in church? Was it church or Sunday school? What is it? Ask your parents what their favorite song is. I'm asking because we sing these songs every Sunday, and these songs, as we grow through the years, have different meanings for us as we learn to, to understand them differently. When I was in junior high school, we sang this musical called Good News, and as I found it on the internet, it reminded me of great memories of great songs, Do You Really Care?, uh, the song Good News itself. And as I've grown up throughout the years, those songs helped nourish me to help me become the person I am. In the hymnal, there is a, one of my favorite songs is hymn number 666, What Wondrous Love on This. And I want to share with you why. The fourth verse is absolutely beautiful. It says, and when in death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when in death I'm free, I'll sing on. And when in death I'm free, I'll sing God's love for me. And through eternity, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And through eternity, I'll sing on. That song is so meaningful to me because it's a reminder that one day I will see God face to face and I'll have eternity to sing God's praises and God's love. So my question is really quite simple. What is your favorite hymn or your favorite Sunday school song? As you come back together and worship in this place, uh, what are the songs that you're going to learn? What are the songs that really speak to your heart as you grow in God's grace and God's wisdom? We hope to see you soon, and we explore more songs and more hymns together. But hold on to those favorite ones, because as you grow in years, those songs will help keep you grounded. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever re welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, None of these will lose their reward. The gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. This is the third Sunday that we've dealt with this passage about Jesus sending out the twelve. This ends chapter 10, chapter 11 goes on to Jesus hearing about the death of John the Baptist. And the idea is that Jesus sent out the twelve. And so I want to reflect on this past three weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, I did one on the sending of the 12. Last week, Pastor Steve talked about giving up everything uh, of, and love for Christ and, the, and, the, and proclaiming the gospel. And so I'm going to look for the idea of, uh, are there 12 people, metaphorically speaking, in this congregation? 
There are so social scientists and uh, church historians who believe that we in are in a time of reformation, what I consider a time of significant questioning. And it's significant because the questions include, who is God? What is the role of church in my life and in society in general? What is the purpose that religion even serves in today's world? And those thinkers trace the roots of this, uh, this reformation back to the 60s. Sort of the seeds are placed in the 60s. In the 1960s, it's probably the late 60s, we had a war going on, and we were divided as a country whether or not we should even be there. There were race riots. There were, the Stonewall had the gay riots. Young men were growing their hair long. There was this rise of stuff called rock music, and the, our country was in turmoil. In 1968, Dr. King was assassinated. In 1970, we had the Kent State killings, and our country was in turmoil. And the church stayed out of it because in the suburbs where I lived, we watched from a distance. We didn't get involved. But we did sing this tune, uh, a musical called Good News. It was a Christian rock opera. Uh, my church choir had maybe 60 to 80 kids in it. I found it on the internet the other day under antique music, which made me feel especially young. Uh, you could hear the recording. It only had the second side of the album on it. If you don't know what an album is, talk to your parents or grandparents. But the, the music from that time, as I listened to it, brought up these great memories. Good news, good news coming, good news coming. We sang a song, I'm a Rebel, for a Southern Baptist, meaning you're a rebel, meant that you were dating a Methodist. The idea behind the, the Good News musical was it was training us to go into the neighborhoods to witness to the love of Christ to the heathens, your Roman Catholics and Lutherans, because we knew you drank and you needed to hear the word of God. <clears throat> but what we were being taught was there is a separation between church and where society was living. Some pastor dared to get involved in the civil rights movements of the 60s. And I think specifically of John Shelby Spong, uh, later known as Bishop Spong. And Bishop Spong, in his uh, biography, told the story of walking arm in arm in North Carolina with black civil rights leaders and people cursing him and spitting on him. And these were people from his congregation. And what a challenge it was. For the most part, the church stayed away because our job was preacher, you need to save souls, but that's not a preacher's job. Our job is to proclaim the kingdom of God, even in the most difficult times. But what happened was they said, this is life, and this is church. Church, you do on Sunday mornings. Your job as church is to baptize people, marry people, and bury people. And when do people come to church who don't normally come to church? They come from baptisms. They come for marriages, and they come for funerals. And then they go out. We sort of set up this, this separation between church and life. And that runs contrary to what Jesus did. Jesus found a way to connect religion and everyday life. He used it in telling stories, stories about seeds. You throw seeds out, there's a hundredfold of people thought, that's crazy. He told seeds, stories about mustard seeds and how large they became. He told, told stories about sheep and shepherds and leaving the sheep behind, going finding that one. Jesus talked about everlasting water, you'll never be thirsty again. Food, you'll never be hungry again. Jesus found a way to connect life and religion to where it made sense to people. But starting back in the 60s, we started to divide. Church is Sunday morning, and life is lived the rest of the time. And so I'm wondering, is there 12 people, it's a metaphorical number, willing to go out and engage the world, willing to go out and listen, and then come back and share? These are my thoughts. They do not represent your pastor, your staff, anybody in the congregation. I think the church should be at the Black Lives Matters riots, protest, demonstration, you choose your word. Not to condone what's going on, not to condemn what's going on, 
but to listen. Not necessarily to the speeches. You go find that person off in the corner over there, and you listen to their story. Why are they here? This is something passionate to them. They're out here. They're giving up their time. Why are you here? I think my first sermon here I told you about, my wife and I were Mardi Gras. We went to uh, what I kind of playfully call the war zone where you have the people holding Jesus sign. You have the people over here who are slightly inebriated or completely inebriated. And there's this, there's this huge clash. And I went there intentionally because I wanted to listen. And off to the corner over here in the shadows was this guy holding this cross. And so I went over there and I said, you know, the action's over here in the light, and you have your cross over here in the dark. And he said, and I think some of these guys just travel the country, and they do this, I don't know, for a living. But uh, he said, well, I was at Palm Beach, and I was attacked, and my cross is torn up, and I'm afraid. But we had a, a moment where he could tell me and talk to me about what was going on in his life. I went to one of the people holding the signs over here who kept saying how much God hated people and condemned people, and I asked, so what is it you're trying to convey? And my wife and I had an, just an incredible conversation with a young lady who worked in one of the clubs around there, and we got to hear her story. We had a chance to listen to people living life and what's going on. So yes, I believe that the church should be at the Black Lives Matter uh, riot, demonstration, whatever word you choose to use, to listen to the stories. I think the church should be at the gay pride parades, listening to the stories. You're going to hear stories by young men and women who came out and were gladly embraced by their families. You're going to hear the stories of young men and women who were condemned by their families. You're going to hear people talk about suicidal thoughts. If you're lucky, they'll be honest with you. And maybe just for a moment, the kingdom of God can break in. President Trump is running for re-election. When he comes here, there's going to be people in favor of him, people not in favor of him. Can the church go down there and just listen to what people are saying? Don't get wrapped up in the hype, but just listen because they're passionate. They're living life here. And too many times the church says, we're going to wait till Sunday morning. Are there 12 people say, I want to go listen? Former Vice President Biden is also begin, going to come in. And you're going to have the same dynamics. And are there people saying, I want to go listen? There's a young lady I was ex very good friends with a few years ago. And she, she's happily married, has, has a beautiful family. But in the process of having her family, she had two miscarriages. And she said the most difficult thing were Christians who really meant well. They saw her suffering, and they'd come in and throw Bible verses, all things work well for those who believe and love God, whatever that verse says. And she said, all I wanted people to do was to listen. I'm suffering. Are there people who will hear my grief? And I'm wondering if it is a time for us to simply listen, not condemn not condone, but simply go down with an open mind and see if someone will share their story with us. You, abiding presence, are in such an incredibly unique position. You have an intern coming in, a incredible young man who's been through three years of seminary. He's going to come with fresh eyes and fresh ears, and he's going to walk this journey with you as you do some, some dreaming, some visioning, for your future. The first 13 years after I graduated college, I was a band director. One thing we would do is we'd invite a clinician to come in. And the clinician would sit there and we'd say, basically, what am I not seeing and what am I not hearing? And the clinician would come in and they'd say, well, here's what, here's what I see going on. And they would improve my teaching techniques and they'd improve the quality of the music coming from the band. And here you have a young man coming in. In a sense, like a clinician, you get to train him. But as you say, we're, we're, we are a place of grace. Maybe he can ask how. We're a welcoming place. He might be able to ask how. 
Some of you are wondering, well, what happened to the call process? Well, COVID's what happened to the call process. This is not the time to call a pastor, but it is a great time to listen. And you'll have a year where you can open your ears and open your eyes. And are there 12 people who will go out to these places, listen, and then bring that back to the small groups that you already have forming and say, Here's what we hear. Is there some way that abiding presence can, can bring together the schism of church as a sunny thing, but life is lived over here in Travis Park? No, can we bring that together just like Jesus did where we make the gospel and religion of God real in people's lives once again? Because here's the uniqueness. You can call a second pastor or you can staff for the future of the church. I think the future of the church depends on listening. Are there 12 people who are willing to go out into the world and listen and come back and share the good news of Christ that they've heard? <laughs> Let us confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. God of companionship, encourage our relationships with our siblings in Christ. Bless our conversations, shape our shared future, and give us hearts eager to join in the shout of praise. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, mercy is, great. is great. 
God of abundance, you make us your creation and grow all that we need. Inspire us to care for our environment and be attuned to where the earth is crying out. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of mercy, your grace is poured out for all. Inspire authorities, judges, and leaders to act with compassion. Teach us to overcome fear with hope, meet hate with love, and welcome one another as we would welcome you. We pray for politicians, protesters, and police. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of care, accompany all who are in deepest of need. Grant healing for those who are, are sick or full of sorrow. Comfort those who are lonely or abandoned. Strengthen those who are imprisoned or awaiting trial. Renew the spirits of all who call upon you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of community, we give thanks for this congregation. Give us passion to embrace your mission and the vision that you lay before us. Teach us how to live more faithfully with each other. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of love, we gather in your embrace all who have died. Keep us steadfast in our faith and renew our trust in your promise. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let's share that sign of peace with those around us and text somebody right now, peace be with you. Chip, peace be with you. And also with you. We do more than baptize Mary and Barry at Abiding Presence Lutheran Church. We seek God and we serve others, proclaiming the kingdom of God in all that we say and all that we do, not just on Saturday night and Sunday morning, but every day. And today we're invited to go out and listen. Each and every gift offered makes this a reality. Thank you for your continued generosity.
Let us pray. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Your word is a light for our path. Nourish us through this gift that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. We continue with the thanksgiving for the word. Let us pray. O God of justice and love, we give you thanks that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end bring all the world to your feast, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Now may God, the Creator, Jesus, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Be at peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.